Hi, I'm here with Leonard Pottering from Red Hat, uh, who's the author of Pulse Audio, which is one of the essential components of a Linux desktop here at the GNOME Guadic Conference. So, hi, Leonard. Hi. Um, so, tell me about Pulse Audio. Everyone knows that audio on Linux sucks, so why did you write Pulse Audio? Um, I mean, the obvious question is, of course, uh, answer is, of course, that we want to make it not suck anymore. So, um, yeah, I think we, we, we made a certain certain um, inroads in, in actually fixing Linux uh, audio, but it, we're not there yet. But it's, it's getting better and better and better, um, especially in the last year. Um, the things are falling nicely into, into the right places, and things look much better now than they looked two years ago. So I must confess that now audio on all my laptops actually works now with Pulse Audio, which That's it didn't the last few uh, releases. Um, so, so what does Pulse Audio do for you that the earlier versions of ALSA and OSS don't? I mean, why do we have this layered audio system? Um, so, yeah, I mean, we still use Al- ALSA. Um, ALSA did not go away. It's just ALSA is a, is a low-level hardware interface, so, so it abstracts what the hardware can do and provides a common common API for this kind of stuff. But it, it focuses most, mostly on PCI hardware and USB hardware and a um, couple of other things, but that's mostly it. Um, Pulse Audio then sits on top of that and adds a couple of features um, um, that, that go beyond the mere access, um, like in reading and, and, and writing to CM. That is, um, for the most obvious case that probably everybody would think of right away, is this audio mixing that you can play two things. Um, if, if you're just interested in audio mixing, you would, however, not use uh, need Pulse Audio anyway. So um, Pulse Audio adds a lot of top on top of that. For example, there can be all kinds of filters, like up mixing and down mixing, for example, that that, that if you play a surround stream on a stereo device, that it actually gets stuck, um, down rendered properly, or at least it's halfway properly, and the other way around too, so that if you play a stereo stream on a surround system, that, that it gets read up um, as well. And you can do all of our other kinds of stuff. For example, we we have, um, I mean, everything that, 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 that you can do with audio that you want to have on the desktop. For example, it, it can be stuff like, like event sounds. Uh, for example, uh, if you want want input feedback stuff, like like you click on a button, you get a sound back. Most people probably don't like this kind of stuff because it's annoying, but it's actually often very very useful um, because um, we we do fancy stuff like like moving the event sounds in space depending on on which side of the screen the event actually happens. So if you click on a button on the left side, you get a, get the sound mostly out, out of the left speakers, and if you click on a button on the right side, it comes out of the right speakers. So it gives you a little bit of a of an audio feedback and on, on where those things happen. Well, there's, there's also um, there's also kind of important for accessibility. So, yes, exactly. Um, where people want to have screen readers that actually will read things and sound natural, etc. So, yeah, a working audio system is... And, and also games. I mean, let's not forget games. Um, yes. Having a working audio system is essential if Linux is going to become the top-class, world-beating gaming platform that we all know it can be. Uh, just isn't quite there yet, uh, I guess. I mean, my, my focus obviously not not really only in games and stuff like that. But yes, we need to provide something yeah, suitable there, um, like like something that 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 has somewhat low latencies. I mean, it doesn't have the strongest low latency requirements, but um, and, and and stuff like that. Right now, I, I mean, I'm 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 not really working on fixing all the various games that that there are, but um, I think most most things work these days. But uh, I mean. The, the, the audio st- or stuff for gaming is actually, from my perspective, very easy because most of the games do, do all the complex stuff themselves. So um, we, we just need to provide a working PCM interface. And um, we had problems with that in the past because... Um, I mean, the general problem with Pulse Audio was basically that, that we, we, we fit something into the layer there that, that was didn't exist before. So, so you had the, your layered audio stack, like the application on top and the hardware and, and below, and we added a completely new layer in the middle. And of course, the, the applications that made 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 uh, assumption about who they were talking to, and the and the drivers made assumptions about what the other applications were requesting, and suddenly all this became completely different because there was this uh, yeah. where there was Pulse Audio. And actually, the most interesting part about Pulse Audio, which is probably not visible to the users, but which I personally think is the technologically most interesting, interesting stuff, is actually something uh, which we call time-based scheduling. Um, it's, it's, it's inspired a little bit by what, what uh, Apple does, and it's actually the, the, the one thing that actually made it so difficult for us to, to stabilize things. Um, because um, to, to explain a little bit what it is, um, is traditionally the, 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 the sound card would, would tell us when it needs new data to play. So it would send us an interrupt, we would supply data to it, 
and then we would go to sleep, and the next time um, the buffer runs half empty, it, the, 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 the hardware would inform us again to, to refill the buffer, and we would do that. Um, that is the traditional way how everything worked. It, it's, it's like um, if you just used ALSA, that's always how it worked. And on Windows, work, things worked um, like this until Windows um, XP, I think. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, on old Mac OS, it worked as well. But, um, but it's actually very, very unflexible because if you, as soon as you have more than one application playing, then suddenly the buffer size you pick um, becomes very important because longer buffers means longer latency yes. and shorter buffers means lower latency. But on the other hand, lower buffers also mean a higher CPU load yes. and um, more often being You're woken up. up more often. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and in modern, modern desktop computing and in embedded computing, power, power consumption is everything. Yes. It's, it's, it's what, where, where we optimized uh, um, for. So, so what is actually important in, the, in that area is that we can dynamically adjust the buffer size and hence the CPU load and the, and the frequency of waking up to what the applications re request. Oh, so that's the Pulse Audio feature. So in other words, Pulse Audio will dynamically size the, applica yes. the application requests into something that will keep the audio stream fulfilled. Yes. We basically look at all our clients, see, um, they ask them, or they tell us in the first place, what, what latency requirements they have. So, for example, a voice over IP application would say lot something rather low, yes. um, but, but a media player like, like, like a DVD player or, or just music could, could, could probably tell, us, tell us something like, yeah, latency doesn't care, matter at all for us, uh, two seconds are fine. And, and if that's the case, um, then, then we can, can get schedule audio um, in, in a very power consumption friendly way because we could just go to sleep for one second then wake up, fill, fill the buffer up for two seconds again and then go to sleep again Right. and, and that is our ideal case that's really what, what we want to reach and then traditionally um, how this worked is basically we're, we're limited to when the hardware would wake you up like the sound hardware and then you had to stay with that so if, mm -hmm. if applications would come and go um, you could not change yeah. the latency, could not change um, yeah. the, the, the wake-up frequency. And that was very, very lim limiting because, I mean, nowadays everything's dynamic and you have an event sound here and you have a voice call there and, and, and everything happens at the same time. So what Paul, uh, Paul's audio did there is to make that, that all dynamic. It's, it's not a completely new technology. It's basically what Core Audio does. Um, it is what is interesting in Core Audio and, and we basically implemented that. We, we add a lot of stuff um, on top of Core Audio and left other stuff out. For example, we don't really cover with Pulse Audio so much for the professional stuff. Right. We have Jack for that. We don't want to wanna, wanna duplicate Jack. Yeah. But uh, um, we, we added a couple of other things uh, on top. For example, um, uh, Core Audio is mostly, mostly designed to, to deal with floating point um, samples. And, and we, I mean, it's not really an option for us so much because we also need to, 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 to I mean, the ideal audio system doesn't, doesn't touch any kind of samples if it doesn't have to. So I, I want to switch gears a little bit, if I can, and move away from a technical subject and say, so you're obviously extremely knowledgeable about audio systems in Linux. Um, I hope so. so what got you interested in this? How did you get to the, you know, what's your background? How, how did you become the audio expert in Linux? I think it's, 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 um, it's very different probably from most of the other audio people um, who work in, in Linux audio, is that I'm not a musician, I don't have a, have a musical background. Um, I mostly came from, from, from engineering perspective, basically. Because um, in, in, back in the days there was a sound server ship which was called ESD, eSound. Mm -hmm. And and I looked at it and it was kind of, kind of interesting. It was very early design. It was no, no, very, no. Stop talking, very about, stop talking about the technical <laughs> stuff. What I'm asking is about you. What's your background? Okay, so, so How did you that. get involved? How did you... I looked at that and thought, no, no, what, I can do it better. What, what were you do you, you're not a very old chap. What were you doing? I am very old. What were you doing at the time? So were you a student? I, I, I was a student, basically. Okay. And, and I played around with GNOME and, and I looked at the various stuff and, and thought... Uh, I think I am mostly found it int more interesting to work on the lower levels, like not directly in, in the UI stuff. And then I thought, hey, this is interesting. And I have some ideas how I could improve this. And then I sat down and, and, and just did it. I needed a couple of attempts, but um, I think the current design is pretty okay. I'm quite confident that's so, actually the right So thing. basically, you found the need in the software, you started working on it, and eventually you got to the point where... Essentially, people hired you to, to do that. Yeah, work that's basically what happened. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we, we I have been working for, on that for quite a while, and, and I think one of the most important things in, in free software is that you can show that you can can stay with with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I guess I showed that, and so I got the offer from Red Hat. Back then. So so if you were to, if you were to give one advice to a budding young yourself five ten years ago or whatever, what advice would you give about how to be successful working in free software? 
um, show that you can can stay with a topic. I think that's the most most important thing. I mean, of course you do it be crazy with your code and stuff like that. So show some some common sense. But the most important thing I think is show that you you can 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 work on a project and don't lose interest after after a couple of months and and, and then ne- neglect the process uh, the, the the project entirely. It's it's really you need to show that 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 you you are you are you have the the the, the, the um, dedication dedication staying yeah. power yes i mean nobody expects from from that 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 the first project you start is actually successful but uh, um, if you if you if you then then say oh my god okay it wasn't such a good design and maybe you should should start new and do that but but show that that the the topic you're working on that you you are interested in it and, and that that eventually you will come to the right solution and then then people will eventually take notice if if, if for long enough you're around um, then people will take notice and then actually um, put your stuff in the distributions and, and as soon as that happens then they, that they'll pre- notice that you exist and then they'll eventually hire you, <laughs> the, you end, at that point you end up getting a job to do something that was previously fun and then becomes work anyway thank you so much it's still fun for, <laughs> I know I'm, I'm joking I, I must confess I, I've been doing Samba for nearly 20 years and it is still fun I still love doing it so thank you very much for talking to us uh, it's really interesting and have a wonderful rest of the conference yeah you too thank you All right. thanks very much